I've had it, man. I mean, I really, I'm really weird about where we stay at. I mean, because this is not where I envisioned. I didn't grow up like this, you know. My wife didn't either. I mean, but her family is, that's another story. <laughs> I kind of, I wish, I wish you were here. Like I said, she's fighting for the Grand Theft Auto, which is insane. I mean, I don't even. Introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit of your backstory. All right. Hey, man. Richie. Uh, my backstory grew up with a great family. Mom and dad, super responsible. I just chose another path. Um, my lifestyle was a little bit faster and all that. Ended up catching some drug charges, sales charges. Housing market went down when the mortgage crisis hit. Was, was working as a maintenance director for uh, 800 apartments. They laid me off. That was a big hit. So I ended up finding somebody who was selling meth that was a friend of mine and he put me on. I actually only sold meth for about six months and they had knocked me off, man, for being headed to prison, man, seven years. Uh, you know, went to prison, went and taught classes, sobered up five years straight. As soon as they tr transferred me down to Port Charlotte, where I'm from, Charlotte CI, notorious inmate deaths from officers, you know, it was a bad uh, adjustment, a bad adjustment camp. CM guys there, TCU unit, crisis stabilization unit there, real bad place. They have a program there called Life Path. I joined it, taught classes, went outside the gate. They allowed me, because I worked for the warden and everybody, allowed me to go outside the gate. And from then on, my first package I brought in, it was a wrap, man. I was back addicted again that quick. <laughs> yeah. you, were, you were smuggling things. Smug oh, man. And teaching classes about being recidivism and you know drones how you can't go out and sell drugs anymore I got out of prison and was I hit it harder than I was before I ever went in you know I didn't have a girl or nothing like that so I was single pretty much and you know driver's license was good my credit's good you know my face has always been good because I'm just never really did anything wrong to anybody in a just narrowly. I mean, I, there's no doubt in my mind that I've, I've narrowly escaped probably going back to prison longer than I did the first time. You know, that was when me and my wife, when I met her, funny story, she was in jail and a couple of girls that were there met her in there that knew her and was like, hey, I need you to go out and find a guy named Richie. And they were talking about, you know, how, what a great guy I was, you know. She finally came up, met me, and a week later we were married. <laughs> uh, Funny story, I had about three sheets of acid on me. We, we were eating acid, left or right, tripping. We've been married now two years, so going on two years. She, <laughs> she was 25, I was 44, you know? Now she's 27, and I still have 45, you know? Her birthday's coming up, but, I mean, she's my best friend. She's all, I mean, it's awesome. It's, I couldn't even believe it, how, how much older I am than her, but how, you know, mature she is. But she's actually got uh, mental issues. She's di diagnosed split personality, so she's got about six of them. I mean, legitimate, different people. You know, thank God they all like me, except for the one last night when we got into a fight. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about you getting released from prison and still struggling with the addiction, and also tell us how long you've been released from prison for. Well, funny thing, I got released from prison. I, well, I was full-fledged meth addict when I left prison. I was bringing about two ounces a weekend for you know Latin Kings and Pig and the uh, ZMF, which is Zo Mafia family, it's been you know, Haitians down there, and I mean they took care of me. I mean, four, I got out on April twentieth, two thousand seventeen. Funny date, four twenty. You know, I mean, who would even think? Not much of a weed smoker. It just makes me antisocial, so I don't care for smoking. My wife have it pothead. If she don't have it, that's her meds. Uh, but got out, and I just had run into a friend of mine, and he was came back from Michigan, was a, was a heroin addict. He came down there and somebody told him that, oh man, you know what, you know how to get off heroin? You get on meth. I was like, hey, dude, really? I said, so you went from heroin to meth. Now I just talked to him the other day, he's doing freaking half a gram shots, freaking, you know, five days a week, 10 times a day, you know? So I said, what's better, you know, what are you doing? But I got out, I started driving for a, for a dealer you know, because I had a license. Nobody's got a license anymore. They take it for just about anything. I had a license, so I started driving for her, and she ended up catching some charges, went to jail. Well, now all the people that she was dealing with all knew me, and I grew up with some of them, and I just kind of took off from there. And my, br and my brother, which I was just talking about, like my best friend, he's like, man, you're going to be right back where you started at, Richie. He said, watch, man. I mean, it wasn't 
three weeks, man, I went from flipping a ball to feeling four or five ounces on me at a time, you know, then I met my wife and she really did change my world, man. Her kids, you know, I saw another chance, you know, to try to show these kids that, of hers who really didn't have much and were missing her mother a lot because she couldn't get along with her parents and the kids were at her parents' house. I thought it would be a good thing and we've been discussing sobriety. I mean, she was getting high through her pregnancy. She just, uh, she was getting high through her pregnancy and she finally just said, no, you know, when it was there. So when she gave birth, she was clean other than marijuana, but she told through the adoption ADC, the hospitals, the doctors, she told them all, you know, listen, man, I, there's nothing you're going to do. If I don't smoke marijuana, she said, you're going to have a mess on your hands, you know, a mental case on your hands. She don't believe in taking any bleached white government and prescribed pills. If they can prescribe all these legal drugs and stuff. She said, why can't I just take pot? Well, now that marijuana is legal in Florida, you know, medical, she was right on the verge of getting her medical ID. But uh, as for me, I was going to get it just so I had it. But, you know, moving forward, really the idea is to get off the drugs and just and be successful. I mean, we haven't had a chance. Every time we get a chance to get into a house, like I said, it just something falls apart. You know, I don't know. Is that and my go-to every time is pick up a little package or something to keep the money rolling. I work all the time. Is this, am I right where I'm, where I'm going? Yeah, I, I do, I, you know, I'll work. And like my wife said, she's like, you know what, you go to work, but the problem is every time you go to work, you end up selling drugs to everybody that does them at work. You know, so you're trying to get their paycheck and your paycheck. And I don't know what it is. I'm standing out here the other day. I was just moving some of our stuff in a guy comes around the corner. He's like, hey, man, you want to make some money? Well, yeah, hell yeah, I want to make some money, you know? I mean, what do you got to say? I'll take you to lunch. I need to go down to the beach, man, pick up something, none of your business what it is, you know? And so when push came to shove, he ended up living, he's on the street with this girl. The other day, it's rainy and everything like that. I called him up. I'm like, dude, I can't let you stay outside, man, you know? You know, I just don't have it in me. You know, we have an extra bed in here, you know? If you and your girl want to come over and stay for a couple of days and... Pretty much, that was now, I got a new plug in Virginia Beach. And like my wife said, she said, man, it didn't take you very long, you know? I said, I wasn't looking for it, you know? I was just doing my thing. I ran out with what I brought here. And I mean, it was just a little bit, I brought a ball with me. And it fucking lasted me damn near a month, you know? I'm not like that, but if, I'm pretty manic without, without the drugs. What's, I, your, uh, what's your, usage, your usage like on a daily basis? Gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, my usage, daily basis, retail value, street value, twenty-five bucks, twenty about three tenths. You know, my price. You know, I've been in it a long time, probably three or four dollars. I mean, which is, I mean, I try to weigh out the thing. I don't drink alcohol. I barely smoke any marijuana. Man, my wife will burn up two or three hundred dollars a week in in reefer. I mean, because it's so expensive nowadays. But like I said, honestly, it's probably four or five dollars a day my cost you know I said so retail value 25 I mean I've had it up to where we were doing a ball a day me and my wife before we decided and just said hey man we got to do something you know we're going to lose the kids forever she's going to she already said if I lose these kids forever she said you might as well put the bullet in my head man for me because I'm not going to be you know they're her life you know what do you think it would take for you to be able to get off of the drugs uh just that that opportunity the one good opportunity getting out of this hotel life I mean even Airbnb I just said normally we're staying in a two-story house in a resort gated community because we'll rent a room from somebody and the houses are beautiful and everybody usually loves me my wife's beautiful I'm pretty outgoing you know I'll hide my shit I don't get high in front of anybody you know I'm not that flagrant nobody in this place in here would ever even know I got high no tattoos that's just by choice you know some people say as my wife says that's your hustle she said you can put on a suit nobody even know you're in prison so most jobs I get, nobody has any idea. If they ask me, I tell them, you know. But uh, they quit getting doors slammed in our face. And, but wherever we go, we meet the same people. There's no difference, you know. And I keep telling her, I say, we got to stay in these communities where the people have, are more successful. They're working every day because if you want to be a millionaire, who do you hang out with? Millionaires, you know. If you get to sit in a hotel ridden with drugs, it's eventually, man, going to hit you. I mean, uh have been many AA meetings, NA meetings, you know, works if you work it, if, you know, people, places, things, and that's the absolute truth. 
you know, Bill W. Whatever. I mean, I don't go to any meetings now, and I believe that probably if I started going to some meetings somewhere, maybe church a little bit more, that would ease it. I wouldn't feel very well going to church on a Sunday, man, being high. So, I mean, but, but that I'd probably just that job. I've waited tables for years, fine dining. I mean, I'm, best I've made is eighty-five thousand a year on a regular basis. I mean, I was doing well, and I had a I was a functioning drug addict back then. It was cocaine was before meth hit down there. You know, I was functioning, you know, of course, I sold the cocaine to the guys that I worked with, too. So, you know, we make it three, four, five hundred dollars a night. I could probably get a couple hundred more of that. There was a thousand dollar days for me back then, man. It was, life was good. House on the water, the boat. But my girl, that that's my son's first mother, was a complete basket case. You know, I was happier driving around, staying in hotels than being, trying to even make things right with her. <laughs> so we pretty much split up and then just a addiction after addiction, the housing market thing with that, and I ended up being selling meth, lady across the street. We were living, actually living in the projects in Arcadia, Florida. The only white people on the street that lived across the street from us, my girlfriend at the time, grew up with her. She's the one that turned me, on, turned me in. <laughs> she had no money to pay the bills. You can't pay your bills at the projects, man. You're really doing nothing, because they pretty much pay them for you. So I put her on. I said, listen, the people you know, go sell. Don't cut your dope. If you want to get high, come see me. We'll get high together. I'll give it to you, whatever. But just sell it and we'll split it thirds. My girl, who's, she was pregnant with my daughter, who I have now. She don't touch anything. She don't get anything, but she gets a third. It was her plug, so she's going to take her third. And me and you will split the other two thirds. And we can make money that way. Well, somewhere she got knocked off and ended up pretty much set me up with uh, six sales charges <laughs> on camera. <laughs> I want to ask this question. I hope it won't be uncomfortable for you. You know, with the situation that you're currently in right now, would you be opposed to selling drugs? Would that be an, if that option presented itself, would you go the easy route? I guess is what I'm asking. You know, I mentioned it yesterday. We were driving in the car. My wife was next to me and we were talking about being default. You know, we're messing with phones, you know, it's a default setting. You know, and that's what I told her. I was like, well, you always know, man, I could always go back to default setting and just and start and pick up a package. And I mean, immediately as I did that, I caught a right hook. I mean, it wasn't a hard one, but she hit me. She's like, nah, it's not even an option. So really, she is my foundation and ground. I mean, does she get high once in a while? Yeah, she does. You know, and I think it's more or less because I do. But like she told me, she says, how can I freaking tell you to stop doing something you've been addicted to longer than I've been alive? You know, she's like, I don't feel comfortable with that. She's like, you've always provided no matter what situation. She says, you go to the end of the earth to make sure that I'm all right. Would it be? <sighs> That's hard to say. I mean, I'm not really down in the dumps. Like, I, you know, I haven't had to sleep on the, on the streets. For surely, we slept on the streets in our van because we wanted to, because really there was anybody we wanted to hang out with and didn't want to spend the money on a hotel room, but that was pretty much the bottom. I mean, this is it for me. This is the bottom for me right here. I mean, this is my valley in the shadow of death type thing. I mean, I had a pretty easy ride in prison, but would I be, ugh, man, that's a tough one. <laughs> you know, if you think about where you want to be, obviously goals and wanting to get up out of this hotel type of a life, you know, what are you doing in an effort to, to, to try to make that happen? Well, we're always looking for work. I was supposed to have a job yesterday. Me and my wife were going to go do. It was going to be promising with some future work involved with it. Uh, it got shut down due to some trucking issues or something like that. So, I mean, it wasn't anything spectacular, but the pay was good. Um, she's She had an interview today. She's starting. She's an independent contractor for a, a sales company selling whatever she's selling. I haven't asked her much about it because if I ask too much, then she starts thinking I'm trying to criticize her with anything or trying to guide her. She wants to guide her own path. So I let her pretty much freely do how she wants to do it. But we're, you know, it's really trying to find that career move, that one, you know, that one job. I'm college educated. I mean, what'd you go to college for? Uh, business management and marketing. You know, I mean, there was supposed to be a restaurant. I have lots of restaurant management, you know, experience. We got an opportunity to open up this restaurant over here. Well, it happens to be that this guy is a freaking blithering drunk. I mean, he is. He's intelligent. He has great ideas. He's already had the restaurant open, and it failed so far because it's not open right now. They don't have any food or anything. So where is the issue at? I told him. I said, let me go in there one time. I said, I'm going to get that smoker out. I'm going to drive this thing around town and put a bunch of signs on homeless guys' backs, man, if they can walk around town with your restaurant sign on it, even if it's a T-shirt. I said, man, people are going to see it. I say, man, these t-shirts are everywhere. It must be good, you know? Even if the homeless guys are wearing it. I said, it's just a marketing thing to try to get him some business. 
I said, man, we'll get on the radio, whatever it takes, man. I'll stand on the side of the road and dance if I have to, you know. So we'll get some people in there and start turning the restaurant around. It's got great food. I mean, I've tasted it, but, you know, right now me and my wife are still on food stamps. I mean, honestly, I told him, I said, listen, my food stamps come in. I'll take the money and put it into food to, to put into the restaurant. If you could get that smoker running, I said, we'll flip the money. You know, the $400 we got, we'll flip it in a, couple, in a day, I'm sure, if the food's that good. And I said, you know, so it's not losing anything. You know, we'll keep the restaurant rolling on a limited menu. But uh, that's what I'm really was kind of. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What would you say to anybody who would ever see this, like the youth? Let's say, for example, what would you say to the youth who might see this? Man, go to school. Go get the education. Play on the athletic teams. Join clubs. Uh, you know, exercise, obviously. But you know what? Do your, do your classes. Go to school. You know, and get your education because you know what? It makes a difference. You know, just because, like I said, there's a lot of guys coming out of prison now, man, that have no education at all, man. And, they're, and I can see why the recidivism rate is 70% or better. I think it's even higher. You know, you know, within the first year, 70% of the people that get out of prison, seven out of 10 are going back to prison in the first year. I know it drops after three. You know, I'm on the two year mark. So, I mean, you know, stay. You know, people, places, things, don't go around the people that were getting you in trouble if that's what you're in to don't, you know. But most of all, stay busy with, you know, positive, you know, just positive things. Play sports, team, even if you're not good, keep playing, you know. With life, man, here's the one thing I, my dad always said. He said, listen, in baseball, three out of ten, you're, the, you're an all-star. You're the best that ever played the game. So, you know, if you fail seven times and you, and you're, and you hit it three times, yeah, and you're still you know, you're an all-star in baseball. <laughs> you know, get back on the horse and ride it, <laughs> you, know, you know. But definitely, don't sell drugs. Don't steal. I mean, there's, and it's, there's a big difference in stealing, man. People don't like thieves, man, not even in prison. I mean, they are beating the brakes off of people for stealing in prison. I mean, you can leave your locker. You'd think it was something out of Oz. It's not like that. Because when you get in there, you can leave your locker unlocked all day long, wide open, man. Ain't nobody taking your stuff. Because if somebody finds out, if one of these gangs or something find out there's stealing going on, they will make him disappear. If it's bloody or dead or however. I mean, I've seen a lot of that. <laughs>